Diana Swain, I'm the senior investigative correspondent for CBC News, here with some of my investigative colleagues in Toronto. We also have someone from the ICIJ in Washington, here to talk about not just the big story in Canada, but the biggest story in the world really right now, which is the revelation that our revelations contained in the Paradise Papers, which were released our time on Sunday and have had ripples really around the world ever since then. It's a joint investigative project led by the International Center for Investigative Journalism, which we will refer to hereafter as the ICIJ. Um, it involves journalists and news organizations around the world working together to really get the biggest impact out of information. And we're talking about reams of information. So what we want to do for the next half hour or so is talk about how the information came together how it was parsed out among all the different participating journalism organizations and then what were the stories in it. This is your chance to ask us any question you've got. Uh, within reason, we'll try to answer it. So let me tell you who's here with me. Chelsea Gomez is with the investigative unit at CBC News. She was a producer who worked on the stories that aired here in Canada and she worked closely with Harvey Cashore who's the senior producer of the Special Investigations Unit. This is not your first rodeo when it comes no. to these <laughs> kinds of data dumps. So we'll talk a lot about that in a few minutes. We're also joined today by Marina. She is in Washington. She is with the ICIJ. She is the deputy director of the ICIJ. And this is Marina Waka Guevara. And she's going to be telling us a lot about, I, I guess, the sort of the genesis of this in a way, Marina. And as we wait for some questions to come in, I actually want to start there. For people who may have heard about the Paradise Papers this week but are still not entirely sure what the conversation's about, <laughs> tell us how this started and what it represents. Thank you so much for having me, first of all. The Paradise Papers is uh, part two of what we thought once that it was the biggest leak of offshore financial information, the Panama Papers. We thought we had learned everything there was to learn about this secret world, and we were ready to take a vacation when we <laughs> got a call from our partners in Germany from the newspaper Süddeutsche Zeitung and told us that, in fact, there was a bigger leak. And it was not just a leak, but multiple leaks of information about offshore jurisdictions all over the world. So we got back to work. Uh, we received the information from our German partners. And we did what we always do at the beginning of these projects, which is apply pressure on the data to see if it is in the public interest. We don't look at leaks just you know, out of curiosity. We look at them through the lens of journalistic investigation. And it took us all but like a few days to realize that the information here was of immense public interest and much broader um, and bigger in, sco in scope than the Panama Papers ever was. And when you talk about large scope and the partner organizations around the world that um, partner up with the ICIJ in a circumstance like this, I mean, the numbers alone, just in terms of the journalistic participation, are huge. We've got nearly 400 journalists in 67 countries. Exactly, and that speaks to the, the, the quality and the quantity of the information. We are talking about more than 30 million files. And this is like really complicated uh, uh, corporate data, um, 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 financial you know, uh, databases and spreadsheets, uh, things that you don't read every day, you don't see every day, and that connect to 180 countries around the world. So what we thought is like, we need to do justice to this information, and the only way to do that is by inviting uh, journalists from all over the world, you know, from, in this case, about 70 countries to join in, to bring their local expertise, just like our colleagues uh, in Canada did, but also all over the world. Uh, is that local knowledge what help us tell the global story? Okay, so let's drill down now to the Canadian part of this story. Harvey, let me uh, put the first question to you because you've done stories that flowed out of the Panama Papers now, the Paradise Papers, and the question is around tax. Right. I mean, yeah. fundamentally, right? It's like people are paying tax, but are they paying it in Canada? Are they paying what most Canadians might pay? Right. And so Chester has already sent sure. us a question that, that flows from that, which is what possible actions, if any, can the CRA, Canada Revenue Agency, take in regards mm -hmm. to these leaks? So maybe you can answer mm -hmm. the wider question and then drill down to that. Well, the wider question, of course, is that, that when we look at this, this, this data, we're seeing all kinds of 
uh, tax avoidance, some quite legal, uh, some allowed, some actually encouraged, if you can you know, think of it that way, by governments. Other is what they call abusive tax avoidance, where companies are doing something that isn't quite prescribed as against the law, but not quite what the law had intended, and then get penalized for that. And then you have what you would call the criminal tax evasion, which is where you have fraud, and you have documents that you make up so that the tax man doesn't know where your money is, and you have that whole, that whole gamut. As for the question about what can the CRA do and what's it doing, it has issued a press release saying that it's going to be looking at this um, information. It's going to be, it's already committed, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to, to explore these issues. We've done stories in the past what, which have said, okay, that might be the case, but what about some of the big, um, you know, accounting firms? Are you going after them as well? And we'll, we'll have to watch that closely and see how they react. Now, we've got lots of questions coming in, which is great, but I want to bring you into this, Chelsea, because you were <laughs> tasked with one of the toughest things, really, which is to try to put some of this stuff in order. And I know from working with Harvey over many yeah. years that one of his workflows yeah, is, yeah, yeah. let's build a chronology, <laughs> let's try to understand yeah. what happened and when, because that fills in so much of the story, and you were tasked largely with doing that. Well, that was, yeah, that was, um, well, we were both working on that, to be honest, but um, it was really, is important for us and it actually led us to see a lot of things in our particular story on Mr. Bronfman that we might not have recognized if we didn't do that, if we didn't put it in a chronology. It's because we were looking at everything that was coming out of the leak and seeing all of the um, action that was happening on the Cobra Trust from these files, but then if you partner that and you marry it with what's happening in Canada for legislative changes, that's when you really start seeing some of these clues almost come together and maybe the connections between these two separate countries and the actions that are happening in these different countries. You can uh, actually see. Marina, I just want to put this question to you. It's from Ben, who says, quite simply, what are these Paradise Papers? Why do we even call it that? Where did they come from? Okay, so the Paradise Papers is a collection, as I said, of leaks. Uh, it involves documents from two offshore law firms. One is called Appleby and is a very um, high-end uh, law firm that is based in Bermuda but has operations all over the world. And their clients are the, some of the wealthiest uh, corporations and individuals. Everything from Nike and Facebook and uh, Apple to um, heads of governments like uh, uh, Queen Elizabeth II through and her personal state. Uh, the other offshore firm is Asia City and is based in Singapore. And then we also have 19 corporate registries from jurisdictions, secrecy jurisdictions around the world where it's impossible to find out who are the shareholders or directors of a company. And now for the first time we can analyze this data and we can do searches inside those corporate registries and see who has incorporated a company in these places. Harvey, next question to you, this comes from Robert, who says there's a perception that the CRA will not go after the wealthy and elite because it's too difficult, too right. time consuming, too costly. Right. That going after the little guy is a lot easier, he says more commonplace, what's it going to take? to go after the big players. Well, I think he makes a good point. We've done stories in the past which, where we see, you know, in fact, the CRA itself identified years ago that it was easy to go after what they call low-hanging fruit, you know, the waitresses, the truck drivers who aren't de declaring some income, but really difficult to go after some of the big accounting firms and the high net worth individuals. And I think part of the reason for that, and this is why the ICID has done such a good job, is exposing those secrets that are in secrecy jurisdictions. You don't, when you go to the Cayman Islands, it used to be a crime to reveal who your clients were or any details about that, what was happening down there. So the CRA often can't find out what's happening because of the secrecy jurisdictions in those locations. So Chelsea, we've got a question from Sam who says, how is Prime Minister Trudeau involved? And th this is one of those questions that I think we as journalists sometimes try to say there's a lot of nuance here. And, and steps between mentioning the Prime Minister and the connections to these papers. So what can you tell us about where his name has emerged in the stories? Uh, well, Mr. Tr like Prime Minister Trudeau's name didn't come up in the Paradise Papers themselves. So um, it's his chief fundraiser, Stephen Bronfman's name and company and his company's investment company that we were looking into. So that's the connection. That's what we were looking at. And, and when we did our stories, we were we were raising um, Prime Minister Trudeau and his um, declarations that he's going to start taxing the wealthy. He's going to be cutting, um, helping the middle class, cutting um, cutting some tax rates for the middle class, and then also we were almost um, asking questions about that because if someone is so closely tied to him, but then also involved in this offshore trust and the company run by them, then there's a lot of questions that we need to ask. Um, 
And that's uh, that's what this comes to often, right? Is that it's not it's not a black and white yeah. legal issue that's being addressed. Often it's political sensitivities or even mm -hmm. moral questions about how do you campaign mm -hmm. on this mm -hmm. message and does it stand up against this information? Exactly. Exactly. So it, when uh, I remember it was what a year well many months ago when uh, Marina Walker and Jared Ryle called me and said there's a guy named Senator Leo Kober in the in the data. Well, I didn't know who he was. Turns out he was one of the most influential, <laughs> you know, chief fundraisers for the Liberal Party, going from Pierre Trudeau to uh, uh, John Turner to Jean Chrétien to Paul Martin, and he had, and he was a senator, and he was chair of the Senate Banking uh, Committee. Wow, um, he had this offshore trust in the Cayman Islands, mm -hmm. and while Parliament was debating, discussing, clamping down on offshore trust, so you really saw the intersection of yeah. of of, uh, of government and business in, the, in, this, in this league. Well, and in raising Senator Colbert, you raise a, a point that goes well to our next question, Marina, for you, which is, uh, his name wasn't familiar to you, Harvey, because he hasn't yeah. played a role like that for a while. And so right. this question from Donna, Marina, is, in terms of the individual accounts, how far back do some of the investments in the records go? We actually have investments that go back to the 1950s. So we can see uh, really a really interesting and large uh, span of time, which allows us to follow the money and to follow the ups and downs uh, you know, of the different investments and individuals and companies within the leak. But then, as Harvey said, the most interesting part is when we make the leak talk to the real world, or when we, we make the uh, ordinary world talk to the secret world of tax havens. And that's where the real emer uh, stories emerge, the stories of the conflicts of interest, the stories of hypocrisy, the stories of immorality of many of these uh, arrangements. Uh, for those of you listening in or those who have just sort of popped by and you're thinking, what is this? Uh, we are talking about the Paradise Papers, our Facebook Live, and get involved, send us some questions. We know that people have questions because we know that these stories, as Marina was just saying, start out so complicated. They're dense, they're financial, it's driven by documents. As storytellers, as journalists, those can be rich, rich sources of material, but a challenge to try to get down to a real conversation. People are busy, they don't want a lesson on financial dealings. They want to know what the story is. Chelsea, part of your job was to try to look at this information and help discern what the stories were. Mm -hmm. Was that challenging? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Yeah, I mean, we definitely had to weed out some things. I mean, there was lots of different angles that we wanted to be able to focus on or to be able to bring into our coverage, but you almost have to pick where you're going to focus, obviously. There's so much that came out of our investigation. but. Um, for me, one of the criteria was um, I don't come from my financial background uh, reporting on this, so I wanted to know what was going to make me mad or what was going like, to have an effect on me if I was a viewer and what was going to hit home to me. So for me, it was always what would, I re what would resonate with me as a regular viewer if I wasn't in the middle of all of this research and how would I understand this story what would be the best way to say it. Just to add to that, we put together a chronology of events, you know, of all this minutiae and the data and pieced it together with what Marina was saying, the mm -hmm. real world. And Chelsea was saying, and it, what is it, 200 and something pages? Yeah, it was 200, what is it, 250 yeah. chronology? Pages? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's and that just the I chronology. I care about that one. It, it, yeah. it, took, it, took about, <laughs> it would take like two and a half minutes to load on your computer. Yeah. Harvey's yeah. chronologies are, I think, the <laughs> stuff of legend now. People yeah. are saying, do you have a close notes to this chronology? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, they would ask yeah. us for a brief yeah. on the chronology. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm curious, Marina, I'll ask you first, but I'd, I'd like to hear Harvey's perspective, too, because I know that both of you have done a lot of work on this sort of material reaching back beyond the Panama Papers. Do you think that this, Marina, is going to discourage people from using offshore trusts, mm -hmm. offshore accounts? I think the message uh, has been already and, and now it certainly intensifies that secrecy is kind of over. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, accountants and the big four accounting firms are going to continue, are going to, you know, they are already, as we are speaking, they are probably trying, they are going through the stories and they are trying to come up with the next loopholes that they're going to try to exploit or the next jurisdictions that they're going to try to come up and turn into tax havens. But I think the message has been really powerful that there are enough people out there that are outraged, enough people with access to information that are willing to share it with journalists. And their journalists, are, and I say it humbly, are doing a pretty good job 
at dissecting that information, actually understanding it, which is something that these accountants always try to tell us, oh, you just don't get it, it's exactly. too complicated for yeah. the lay people to understand. Right. We actually have understood it mm -hmm. and have written uh, powerful stories of public interest. So do yes, I think they, sh they mm -hmm. should be discouraged. Do you think that the tone of the phrase offshore account, offshore trust, Harvey, I mean, it's, if you'd asked people five well, years ago if they had yeah. much of an opinion on it, they might mm -hmm. be, oh, I've heard of them, but I don't really understand them. I don't right. have enough money to worry about it. Yeah. Now there's there's kind of something attached to it. There, there is, and, and yet for years, like, you know, the first time I ever did an offshore story was to do with these Airbus accounts and Liechtenstein, and they were, you know, going to um, you know, politicians and that kind of thing in Canada. Um, but uh, the, the whole idea, there's, a, you know, there's an island called Bermuda. Right, it's, and, and on that island, 500 years ago, there were sea turtles and there was birds. That's all there was. And now there's a whole financial offshore services financial sector, right, that is built up and grown up. And my question is, the, the main town there is Hamilton, Bermuda. And maybe the, the essential question is, why Hamilton, Bermuda? Why not Hamilton, Ontario? What's wrong with Hamilton, Ontario? And you, you realize <laughs> they've set up these, these laws so that the high net worth individuals and corporations can go there pay huge um, uh, you know, administration fees, but no tax. And that's more worth the while than being in Hamilton, Ontario. And Chelsea, this gets to the heart of every one of these stories for me. Mm -hmm. you know, for as long as Harvey's done them, I've done them, any journalist has done it, it's making that connection for people that this is not just a world other than the one you live in. Right. But if mm -hmm. somebody else isn't paying their fair share of taxes, mm -hmm. you're paying their share of taxes. Exactly. And the question is, how much does this raise an average person's taxes? Is there any way to know, any way to lock down the impact of I, I don't know, the actually, Canadian there is experience. a way to know because the CRA hasn't actually put out a complete estimate of how much Canada's losing by allowing corporations or wealthy families or even um, middle income families from going offshore. It really, there isn't a, a, a finite number that has come up, so it's really hard to uh, it's really hard to actually estimate how much we're losing. But I mean, we all see it in our communities where things are not getting paid for, and funding is getting cut for many different really well-deserving projects. So there is definitely a question of well, why and where? How can we make up that money? Are, are we doing our best to keep the the tax? revenue here in Canada. That I remember the late Jack Layton when he was NDP leader standing up after one of your other stories Harvey <laughs> and the, the question was how much are we missing and he was guessing based on this kind of number people are trying to pull out of the mm -hmm. air that it was maybe eight billion dollars yeah. a year. Right. That's going back half a dozen years. Right. I think there was somewhere between like there was eight billion or six billion upwards of like tens of billions of dollars, right? It could be even far greater than that. This is what's called the tax gap and other countries have measured it. The UK has measured it. The United States have measured it. They've given us a real number. Here's what we expect to collect and here's what we don't collect. The CRA, as uh, the Star reported today and the CBC, does not calculate that number. And that's a good question. But, you know, conservative estimates are six, six billion a year conservative. And one of the questions that the CBC and Star asked Canadians was, what would you do with six billion dollars? And it's a good question. If you had it, what would you do with it? What yeah. would I would have gotten three of us chairs. <laughs> we'll start there. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, Marina, we're it. standing. I know you can't see us, but we are standing. Um, yeah. This is a great question to put to you because when we started this conversation, and welcome to everyone who's joining us in this Facebook Live, we're talking about the Paradise Papers. Marina's in Washington, Deputy Director of the ICIJ, which really led this project. And when we started this conversation, you were saying when you got this trove of documents, the first task as it is for any journalist, look through and try to determine if it's in the public interest, not just a violation of someone's privacy. The next piece, and for many people now, this is probably top, is is it real, is it fake? Have you been able to determine, how do you determine whether the information given to you is legitimate? Well, uh, when you're looking at 13 million records, it's, it's really hard to forge that amount of information. Having said that, so that's you know, one first reassurance. But then every time we're looking at a case, we are skeptical. We are never comfortable. We're never thinking, oh, this is, you know, I'm looking here at something that I'm going to trust 100%. We are applying pressure on every single document that we are looking at from this leak. Uh, we have done it in hundreds of cases. And in all cases, when we go again to the real world, um, and we check the names and we check with court records, it always checks out yeah. until now. We will continue doing that with every case we report. Because, you know, of course, you know, this is a gigantic leak. And, you know, um, just on a human level, I do wake up at night sometimes thinking, 
what if there's like one document mm -hmm. in there that is not authentic? And so uh, the way to combat that is doing really good uh, excellent reporting and applying pressure on the information and not trusting it. And that question was from Karen, but I know, Harvey, you want to add something to that. Yeah, which is the, the leak was the starting point, wasn't the end point. And so once we, you know, there were 5,000 documents alone in what we call the Cobra Trust documents, which mentioned Stephen Bronfman, the uh, Trudeau's chief fundraiser. And that was the beginning. We consult, I mean, in Chelsea, we consulted uh, Hansard's uh, debates. We talked to dozens of people. We did interviews. Mm -hmm. And so it was the beginning of a process that got us to the, where we ended up today. And I understand that some of the documents I've talked to with some of our other colleagues who said, you know, it wasn't all just, oh, here's the smoking gun yeah. no. bank ledger. No. There were, you know, music lyrics and love letters and just, you know, <laughs> casual emails between people. And yeah. you've got to filter all this out. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's not, I mean, it's, there's, it's quite uh, boring at times to go through some of these documents, but then it can yeah. be quite exciting because you see some very interesting things. Um, and I would like to know, want to know where they to, can uh, compare notes with my colleagues in Canada, but compared to the Panama Papers, where you had that Latin flavor of those like really colorful emails going back and forth from the Mossack Fonseca law firm, compared to this one, is is a different you know um, mentality and it's much drier. Very it dry. was definitely not as fun to go through. Although um, what what was good was to see that in Bermuda they were celebrating Canada's uh, birthday all the time, like the, you know Canada, so. <laughs> And like in this this year, we went to, we went to Bermuda, and they were selling, celebrating the 150th. So you know, <laughs> Vancouver, Montreal, Toronto, and Bermuda were celebrating. Which the was great visuals for your. Which story. was great visuals. Yeah. It wasn't a horrible being there. I, in my, you know. Yeah. The way you yeah. suffer for yeah, your. I, I suffer. I had. I got, yeah, I got suffer. For that. Um, Marina, Leonard would like to know. Um, I think it's Leonard. There are a couple people actually. would like to know how do they access the the Paradise Papers, or do they have to see it through the filter, the journalists? Well, ICIJ is going to uh, publish, uh, starting next week, uh, the, what we call the structure data, which means the names of all the companies and the individuals linked to those companies in this leak. We're going to start with Applebee, and we're going to continue with the registries and all the rest. Uh, what does that mean? Does that mean that we're going to publish the 13 million documents? No, we're not going to do that. We have never uh, dumped leaks on the internet because that's not what we do. That's not why whistleblowers are coming to us. They're coming to us so we do the journalistic work. But we believe that there's value in publishing the minimal data about who owns a company in a tax haven and we do it for transparency purposes and because we believe that that's information that should be in the public domain, domain and that there's really no reason for it to be secret. So that's why we're taking that next step and people can go in that database. It's at offshoreleaks.icij.org. It already contains more than 500,000 uh, companies, information about those companies in tax havens. And you can see the Panama Papers there, for example, the, Panama Papers companies, and very soon you will get the same information for the Paradise Papers. So often, regardless of the stories that we do, we, we put out the story and then we sit back a little bit. <laughs> I mean, you don't just yeah. sort of drop the threads of it, but you have to wait to see if the public is interested. For sure. Um, and what the reaction is going to be. That's not yeah. something that we actually yeah. generate. But to that point, we have a question from Raymond Harvey. Mm -hmm. So the people who knew the rules best took advantage of them. Is there a recourse for that other than shame on you? Well, that's a really good question because who is writing the rules? And we, we were, when we talk about marrying the chronology of the uh, legislation and lobbying versus, and with the, with the Paradise Papers data, we see that there is a real push on the part of uh, law firms and lobbyists representing these billionaire families to influence and, 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 and affect legislation. And so this is a real thing that happened was that in 1999, the federal government and the Department of Finance said, we have a real problem here. We have a gaping tax loophole. We're going to fix it. We're going to change it. And it seemed like it was urgent. And then you see a whole period of lobbying on the part of a, a, a firm. In fact, at one point, the House of Commons passed the legislation finally after six years. But then when it went to the unelected Senate, the, uh, there was a, such a big campaign that the legislation died on the order paper. So the, the point is, I, we always ask is, people always get this question, yeah, but is it illegal? And that's a very good question. But the other question is, yeah, but who inf influences mm -hmm. the laws that we who have? Who allows it to be legal? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, this is interesting. This is a great question from Dave. And so Chelsea, I'll put it to you first, but Marina, I want to get your perspective as well because you're coming at it from a, a very different space, which is, Chelsea, what's the scariest part about being involved in stories like this? Oh. Uh, for me, it was 
have I not understood something properly? And that's why we were always so careful to, when we were looking at a document that we didn't fully understand, we couldn't grasp it, we took it to an expert and we said, talk to me about this. Am I right in thinking this? Does this mean this? Or what do you think? Can you, can you challenge me on what I'm thinking? Or, so we had, we had three experts in our story that we would take documents to, very different people from different backgrounds and said, listen, like, can you look at this and tell me what you think is happening here? Um, and if it was what we were thinking, great. And if it was something different, we'd bring it to somebody else. Or, you know, definitely just, just getting other very um, high level expertise to come in and, and either confirm or, um, or negate or, or come against what we were already thinking. It's always that fundamental fear. Am I did, wrong? Yeah, did I? Yeah. Um, am I missing something? Am exactly. I putting two things together that actually don't fit? Yeah. That I, yeah. I need to see it a different way. Yeah. And Marina, you mentioned as well that, you know, you were laying awake some nights going, even if one document <laughs> is, is false or fabricated wrong, does the whole house come tumbling down? But beyond that, what are the, the things that, that you worry about when you take on a project of this size and of this importance and this, this magnitude? Well, my worry is always, like, I want these collaborations always to work great. And, and I really believe that by inviting uh, all these journalists to take part in them, that we are, at the end of the day, we're going to come up with a better, stronger, more impactful story. But the, but the process of doing them over the course of a year with so many people involved is, is a risky process. Uh, I like to think about it as a controlled risk. But it is a risk. So my fears are that, you know, is somebody going to, you know, our journalists are going to uh, be, in, you know, just talk about, about it with somebody they shouldn't? Or is somebody going to um, not pay attention to the security protocol and is going to expose this information? So I worry about the security and the safety of the data itself because it's something that has been entrusted to us. We know that in this world, nothing is 100% safe, we work very hard to safeguard this information, not only because, you know, we want to keep our investigation secret, it's because this is a lot of private information from a lot of people around the world, and we take it very seriously. The, you know, we will we'll, we'll never be the recipient of another leak if we didn't uh, take it seriously. And then my final worry, of course, and it's the final and the first worry, is the safety of the journalists on the ground. Uh, we are in the U.S. and in Canada, but we have journalists working in Burkina Faso, in Nigeria, in Russia, and they have to do, on top of all this really laborious and, and difficult work of going through documents, they also have to confront fairly scary in the individuals in those countries, in countries that are uh, repressive and, and uh, with a lot of censorship. So I, I worry about their safety every day. Harvey, can you talk about some of the steps that you all participated in as journalists to, as Marina was saying, keep the information safe? Well, and also, and I really have to admire the ICIJ for this model, it's a model that says to investigative journalists, we're going to share information with each other. We're, the Toronto Star, we're, we're competitors, you know, we want to beat them to the story. We're now going to share and work together. And that's globally as well. And so it's a whole new mindset, which is we're working together to get the best possible story as a community of journalists. And it's just a whole paradigm shift, and it's really worked. That's not to say there haven't been times when it's been a little bit clunky, and there are, you know, hurt feelings, and like, why did you call so-and-so? But at the end of the day, we feel really uh, uh, proud to be part of this ICIJ family that says, let's stop competing against each other and let's co start competing with each other. But how do you yeah. communicate when you're in different countries working for different news organizations? You yeah. have to communicate, yeah. but you're also trying to do it at a whisper mm -hmm. so that you yeah. aren't found out. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Well, Chelsea? email was barred. <laughs> <laughs> no email. Is, yeah. yeah, everything was on um, an encrypted app. Like, I mean, we used wire, so this time it was all wire. Um, and every phone conversation, every text message, it's all sent through wire. We don't, we don't even, even Harvey and I, when we were talking in the office here, we wouldn't send each other emails. We'd either send people, send each other texts or go and talk to each other in person. So, uh, I have a question here, Harvey, from Sam. Can you clarify? Isn't the idea that they make money overseas, but they're not taxed on it till they actually bring the money into Canada? How do we enforce taxes on money made outside Canada? Is that the right understanding? Well, that's one issue where corporations uh, that have, you know, this is why Barbados was created in Canada. So you have a Canadian company, it's got um, overseas operations, and they go to Barbados and they bring the money through Barbados, which is a much lower tax rate. 
That's one, that's one example. In the case of the Cobra Trust, it was, let's send money to the Cayman Islands, let's let it be invested there, and there'll be no tax on the investments. And then it, what it'll be is it'll be distributed to the, the beneficiaries. So for example, in the case of the Cobra Trust, it was his two children. And as, as you saw in our documentary, there was a real problem because um, if one of the beneficiaries was in the United States. Well, there, the law required they declare that, that income, and that wasn't happening. So they, they fixed that. They went back to the IRS and fixed that. But moving forward, you know what they did? They said, okay, well, there's a, pair, there's a flow chart here that isn't working. So what we'll do is we'll take the, the money, we'll give it to the brother in Israel, and then we'll put the arrow over to her as a gift. And so you see these kinds of, you know, one of our experts called it, this is the way the game is played. Yeah, you see game. these games being played. And so it might be, you know, back to your original question, it might be legal, it might, um, but is it what the legislators had in Within mind? Within the spirit it of the law. The, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Marina, there's a question here that's repeated a couple of times. We've had the Panama Papers, now the Paradise Papers. People are talking about them around the world. We're seeing the impact of the stories. Do you think that this is going to cause more data dumps, as we also call them, in this way? Is this going to encourage others to, frankly, take the risk of getting that information and then giving it to an organization that, such as the ICIJ that helps disseminate it? I think it will encourage others to come forward. It, we already saw it with the Paradise Papers after the Panama Papers. Uh, and I think that what whistleblowers really value is they have seen that uh, this community of journalists, this family of journalists, as Harvey calls it, it works. We trust one another. We worked in a fairly coordinated and efficient manner. So for a whistleblower, you know, you go to one person, in this case a newspaper, to Deutsche Zeitung, and then the information gets uh, really thoroughly examined and published simultaneously in 70 countries around the world. That is uh, a proposition that is, is very, um, you know, uh, exciting and, uh, and pretty unique. So I think we are going to see more of this. And my um, recommendation is, like, let's not be complacent. Let's take every one of these disclosures very seriously and never feel like we are uh, too good at it. That, oh, because we did the Paradise Papers or the Panama Papers, we can do it again. I always like to think we always have to relearn everything every time we do a new investigation and take it as you know, um, the biggest challenge we have in front of us. We have a question here, Harvey, from Tejas. And, and Chelsea, feel free to share mm -hmm. your thoughts on this, too. The question is, do we expect any reforms after these leaks? Mm -hmm. There's also that feeling sometimes when a big story comes out, there's lots of reaction. It's not always instantaneous. And you and I see many times where it kind of builds, yeah. sure. but it doesn't necessarily result in change. You're right, exactly. And just to, I know Chelsea and I have had this very conversation, which is, you can see like from the very first ICIJ offshore leaks, when was that, five or six years ago, Marina? I can't remember yes. now. And every time you see one of these leaks, you get the reaction in Ottawa, and, and the um, revenue minister gets up and says, we are going to change the system. It's going to be different from now on forward. We're going to collect all this money. And then there's another leak, and then there's more information. And you, and you, so you start to wonder, well, are they, are they seeing this just for, for public reasons, or is it really happening? And so I think, you know, we've done stories in the past about the, uh, the you know, the role of the accounting firms and the, and the partnerships with, with the CRA. And so it's a real question, it's a good question, which is, when will the public see real reform? And the answer is, I don't know, we don't, we don't know. We don't know. I mean, we can hope that maybe this would be the, maybe a straw that broke the camel's back, but you never, you never know, you never sure. So I think it, it is, though, I think it does raise um, this, the idea that the everyday, like we as taxpayers, and the public actually have to put pressure on the government and um, not just let it happen naturally. I think there needs to be um, sort of everyone who is maybe frustrated with these stories that are coming out. Right, write, write to their MPs, right? This is a great question from Gerald. Harvey, I'll put this one to you. How, um, what, sorry, start with the question from Kelly. Just get my questions in line. We've got lots of them coming in. So Kelly, what do you say when people say the story is actually an attack on capitalism? I, I would say it's probably mm. the almost the opposite. That what you know, as journalists, we are trying to tell the world what's really happening, what's really going on in the world. And I've always said, look, when these leaks come out and we expose how these big corporations work and high net worth individuals work, if the response of of the, of the citizens is to say that's fine with us, we're cool with that, then that's that's what they can do. But 
we are providing information to the public and what we hope are democracies that will say, okay, this is acceptable or, or unacceptable. But one thing I'll just, what I will say, and I think it's a question we've always had is, okay, if these laws are acceptable, these, these rules in a place like Bermuda, and the government allows big corporations and high net worth families to go to Bermuda, why not make those laws uh, available here for other Canadians? So why do you have to leave Canada for other laws because you don't like Canadian laws? And I would say, you know, a fairness question might be, why can't we all have the same laws? Yeah, why do you have to be wealthy to right. yeah, get wealthier? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, but also, Diane, I think that it's important to remind people that, you know, they are not pow powerless. They actually can be very powerful. Uh, we all use the uh, products that these multinationals produce. We have leverage here when we read a story about the tax acrobatics of companies like Apple. There's things we can do to put pressure on those companies and to put pressure on um, uh, our elected officials. So what we hope is that uh, citizens will read these stories. Hopefully, if we have done a good job, they would feel right. outraged and they would ask questions. So one of the features of this, and we've touched on this, is that there were a number of journalistic organizations from a range of countries, all with different regulatory systems. You know, the rules, of course, don't always yeah. sync up but we're still able to talk about the wider story. Is there a way to have a wider impact or is it really going to be country specific, how each country approaches this issue to try to get closer to something that most people would think of as tax fairness? Marina, I'll put that one to you. Okay, uh, well I think um, uh, countries are trying, they are using some international forums to try to come together uh, on these topics, but as Harvey said, it's really hard because at the end of the day, each country is looking after its own interests, and some countries um, uh, thrive on the reality of being tax havens or having tax havens pockets within them. And one of those examples is the United States. The United States has several states that are uh, function as tax havens for people from around the world, Latin America and beyond. So until, you know, uh, I think that, yes, there's a lot of like uh, introspection to do in each country and of course also uh, concerted efforts um, uh, around the world. Um, Chelsea, I want to ask you, we've just got a couple of minutes left to go. I mean, there are investigative journalists who would give their IT for an opportunity to work on a project like this and might work their entire careers and not have that chance. Yeah. Um, what was this like for you? And, and everybody was talking before we went on live here on Facebook that it's, it's actually physically exhausting. It sounds mm -hmm. like it shouldn't be, but it is. Mm -hmm. um, would you do it again? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Are uh, you standing right here? Well, <laughs> you know, it, it's interesting because when I saw the Panama Papers come out, I was like, wow, that's interesting. Like, it was intense. I watched everybody working on it. Um, and so, you know, like, goes away. And then, um, then I get a call saying, can you come and meet with Harvey? He's got a, a story to talk to you about. And chatted. I mean, the minute you told me about um, what you had been seeing in the data, I was like, wow, I, I want to work on that story. Yeah, I want to, yeah. yeah, I want to. I have a part, I want to be able to participate in this. But you know, you go through waves of, I'm exhausted, exhausted, oh, I'm excited, oh, I have absolutely no idea what I'm looking at. And <laughs> I, I mean, the first few weeks, I was just sitting down and getting like a basic understanding of international finance, the use of tax havens, how they're used, what is certain, like what are capital gains, how are these things paid, what are the taxes are supposed to be different. Like, I mean, it, it was, steep learning curve in the beginning. So, I mean, if you had asked me a couple weeks in, I'd be like, no, not doing it, not doing it again. But now I'm like, yeah, I like it, Maybe, it's good. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would do Have it again, rest. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, not now. No, 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 not right now. A couple weeks in between yeah. the next Exactly. One, and of course, you know, the stories aren't done for any of the journalists, whether it's those who are taking part in Canada, which mm -hmm. we should say again is yeah. CBC, Radio Canada, the Toronto Star, the Canadian partners of the ICIJ in this. But this is, seems like the, the best question to end on, Harvey. So I'm going to put this to you, which is that's that idea that maybe we're not done here. Yeah. Joel asks, how much of the offshore industry would be covered in these Paradise Papers, the Panama Papers? It seems to him like a couple of firms and a couple of jurisdictions of what must be hundreds of firms. Well, that, and Marina could probably answer that question better, but that's exactly right. I mean, we're looking still at a, at a, at a needle in a haystack of what's really out there. We're just looking at the, a few of these firms and it's happening with dozens and dozens and dozens of firms. But even within this, within this leak, there's already like 12 stories I want to keep on going after and there's another one I want to get back to. And so 
you know, even within this one, there's more to, there's more to learn and more to understand. And, um, you know, after we get some more rest and, and uh, you know, uh, take some time, we're going to get back, right back to it. I know it's cliche, Marina, but I was going to say, I, I have the sense that we're all saying stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned, yes. I think that we are going to see, we're already getting a lot of uh, requests from other journalists from around the world, from countries that we haven't covered. And so we are already planning phase two of the Paradise Papers from countries that uh, really need to look into the data and find their stories in there. Mm. The best thing about Facebook Live is there is no hard finish time. So I know you were just about to say something, Chelsea. Oh, I, uh, I was going to say, as you, were, like, you asked what I do it again, um, I mean, I'm, What's fascinating to me about the data and the fact that the ICAJ actually releases at least portions of it is that it actually supplements other stories that you're either looking at or working on. And so, mm -hmm. so many of my stories since the Panama Papers came out, I'd be like, wait, let me check the Panama Papers data and see if there's anything in there. And now we have this additional data set that we can go and check and see if some of the other people that we're looking at for other stories, completely unrelated stories, mm -hmm. it's just another data source, it's just another tool that we can use to find out if there's any kind of connection to offshore havens. Thank you, all three of you. Thank you to everybody who sent questions. I'm sorry, I didn't get to everyone who sent one. Um, I tried <laughs> and tried to sort of summarize where I could. These were great questions um, and just, you know, sort of explains again why the work is important, but also why we make ourselves accessible to you to let you ask us directly what you want to know to fill in the gaps of the reporting sometimes. Uh, Marina, thanks so much. I can only imagine that you among us all are by far and away the most <laughs> exhausted. Um, so thanks so much. It's Marina walker Guevara. Thank She's the so ICIJ's much. deputy director who's in Washington. Thank you very much. And of course, my own colleagues, Harvey Cashore and Chelsea Gomez, who thanks. are with the investigative unit here in Toronto that has done incredible work and is still doing it. I know that you're like running off here to your desk, so. Exactly. We yes. await yeah. the next stories from the Paradise Papers. Cool. Thanks so much, Diana. Appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Marina. Thank you. Bye, guys. See ya.